<laughs> Thank you, Bob, very much. It's interesting, I got a very wonderful lesson the other day listening to um, a radio talk show where Richard Diamond, who had been um, uh, Bush's budget director, was talking about his new book and explaining his philosophy of education. I'd always been concerned about this term extremism. I mean, I'm an extremist, according to uh, the so-called moderates or the left or whatever, and I suppose most of you would be considered extremists. And I finally found out what an extremist is. Well, you see, Darman explained it very nicely. He was explaining his philosophy of government, how the government works. He said, we have two parties in Washington. We have the Democrats and the Republicans, and their job is to compromise in order to move the government forward. Now, he didn't explain forward to what. He just said that you have to have compromise in order to move the government forward. That's why you can't have a third party. You see, what they are engaged in is the dialectic. Are you familiar with what the dialectic is? The dialectic was uh, formulated by a German philosopher by the name of Hegel. He formulated the means by which history progresses, and he said it progresses in a dialectical fashion, where you have a thesis and an antithesis, and they do battle and create a synthesis, and you move forward. Now, that dialectic is at the heart of communism. They call it dialectical materialism. Uh, Hegel was not a materialist. He believed that there was a great spirit out there but Marx said, well, there is no such thing as a spirit out there. So everything is just matter in motion, materialism. And, and so the communists have used the dialectic as the scientific means to move the world toward communism. Well, lo and behold, that very same method is being used in the Congress of the United States by Republicans and Democrats. And that's why you cannot have a third party. Why? Because a third party would, ups would upset the dialectic. Got to have a compromise between these two entities in order to move uh, the government forward. What does that mean? That means there must be compromise. You cannot stand on principle. You cannot have absolutes. And the reason why they term us extremists is because we believe in absolutes, out of the process. That's why many of our arguments are, are ne never see the light of day in the presidential debates. Isn't it interesting how you have two men debating in Washington and never anything of substance is really said because they're playing out the dialectic, you see. Dole is a perfect dialectician. He's known as Mr. Compromise in Washington, you see. And, it's just, and of course, we know what Clinton is, so we don't have to uh, even think about that. But it was a great lesson because it was Darman who convinced George Bush to renege on his no new taxes. He said, you have to compromise. And of course, George Bush, uh, who I suppose is also a dialectician, because you know how George Bush got started in politics? There was a Bircher running for office, running for the House of Representatives in Texas, and the Republicans chose George Bush to run against him. So his very first run uh, political action was against a Bircher. Why? Because Birchers believe in absolutes. We believe in the Constitution. We believe in God. In Washington, when somebody stands on principle, they call it gridlock. And that's a nasty word. You mustn't have gridlock. You know, it's amazing how far towards socialism this country has gone without the people really waking up to what is happening. And in the education field, of course, it's, it's, it, they're practically, you know, it's, what, five minutes to, to midnight. They are now implementing a total socialist education system in the United States. It's called school to work. It used to be called outcome-based education. They don't use that terminology anymore because too many people caught on to it and it became a dirty word. And so they decided that's, that's their strategy, is to change the vocabulary, change the, the wording when things get too hot. And so they now call it school to work. What kind of a program is it? You know, people often have to, well, what is outcome-based education? What is school to work? Well, what I do is I try to compare it to what we would consider to be traditional education. What is traditional education? Well, when I was growing up, the impression was that the government felt that every child 
should be taught reading, writing, and arithmetic. Every child should be given a certain amount of education. And every child should be given a, a significant uh, body of knowledge, history, geography, etc. And it was up to you how much you wanted to study, how much you wanted to learn. If, if you didn't care too much and you, you passed with a C plus or a C or even a D plus, that was fine. The school wasn't interested in anything else except making sure that you had the opportunity to learn these things. And then after 12 years, they said, go out and make your life for yourself. Do whatever you want to do. You want to become a beach bum? That's, that's up to you. you know, there was no, no uh, force involved. Well, outcome-based education, school to work is totally different. The government is now going to plan your life for you, you see. That's the difference. The government has decided that no more freedom, no more freedom. You are now going to learn what we want you to learn, and we are going to put you in specific jobs because now the purpose of education is no longer to serve you. The purpose of your life is not to serve yourself or your God, but to serve the state, to serve the government, to serve the economy. And so now the education system is being taken over by the large corporations who seem to agree with this. Now, when you have that kind of melding of large corporations and public education, government education, what do they usually call that? Fascism. That's fascism. Fascism is a form of socialism. Mussolini was a fascist, but he was also a socialist. Hitler was a fascist, but you know the name of his party, National Socialist Party. In other words, the government now is going to um, begin tracking you from birth. They will decide what you are to become. By the third grade, you will be, uh, they will designate what kind of a job or a career or profession you should go into. And they're going to do that by all sorts of assessment tests and aptitude tests and all of that. And once they decide what you're going to go into, that's it. That's what you're going to have to do. And you're going to have to earn that certificate of initial mastery because you won't be able to get a job without it. Because they're going to connect the, the economy, the corporations, with the schools. In other words, the, you're going to have these apprentice programs and different programs where the children will be linked between jobs and education. In other words, education will be linked directly to jobs. And that's the kind of system they have, they had at, at least in some of the communist countries. I don't know to what degree they've changed them. I'll give you a, a, an example of that. You remember the late lamented German Democratic Republic? You know, the uh, East Germany, communist uh, country there? Well, recently I was looking through a copy of an old look magazine from 1970, and there was this large feature article on how wonderful East Germany was, that it was really the the miracle of the Eastern Bloc. They were doing so wonderfully well. And in that article, they, it, it said this, I, ha, I, I made a Xerox of it, and it said, all manpower is subject to central planning. The number of future engineers, doctors, architects is part of the national plan. One young man I talked with had wanted to study art, but the national computer had somehow determined how many artists the DDR would need 10 years from now, and there was no place for him. That's what we're being given, exactly what they had in East Germany. And as you know, after East Germany, after the wall came down and they went behind the curtain there and found out how bad the economy was, how poor the factories were, that there was no such thing as an East German miracle. It was another one of these frauds perpetrated on us by our wonderful media. You know, Look Magazine at the time was run by people who were involved with the Council of Foreign Relations. You know, they were putting out a line that they wanted the American people to buy, and that's what happened. And who was responsible for all of this? Well, all of this has been in the works for many years. If you go back to the 1950s, you will, you will find out that it was uh, Benjamin Bloom and his group at the University of Chicago who began laying the foundations for outcome-based education using mastery learning, that is a Skinnerian uh, brainwashing, Skinnerian uh, behavioral psychology uh, to train people. Skinner believed that human beings and rats were very much alike. Now, there may not be much of a difference between B.F. Skinner and a rat, <laughs> but I think there's 
considerable difference between human beings and rats. In any case, it goes back that far. And it even precedes that because this idea of world government has been around for a long time. It actually goes back to the turn of the century with, with Cecil Rhodes and his Rhodes scholarships and all of that. It was Cecil Rhodes who decided that the only cure for war, the only way that we could have permanent peace uh, was by through a world organization run by the Anglo-Saxons, which would be so powerful that no nation would ever threaten war. And so this idea of, of an organization for peace, a world government for peace was so appealing to so many people that, and particularly to the wealthy, uh, that many joined him. And his, uh, his setting up of the Rhodes Scholarships was for the purpose of recruiting the best and ablest young leaders for this new world government. And so these scholarships, have they've had them now since I believe the about 1910 or so, perhaps a little earlier. And now you have these thousands of Rhodes Scholars, and immediately, as soon as you get a Rhodes Scholarship, that's a one-way ticket to the top. You become a Supreme Court judge, you become a senator, you go to Congress, you're big in the local state legislature, and you become President of the United States. And that was Bill Clinton, Rhodes Scholar. The interesting thing about Bill Clinton is that in his uh, acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention, you remember when he accepted his, the nomination for the president's presidential candidacy? Uh, he paid homage to his professor at Georgetown University, Professor Carol Quigley. And he explained how Carol Quigley had had this great influence in his life. 99.999% of the American people never heard of Carol Quigley had no idea what he was talking about. And they figured he was, you know, like paying homage to uh, Miss Smith, his first grade teacher who taught him how to read. But Carol Quigley is a very important person. And you know, Birchers knew exactly who he was referring to. Why? Because Birchers are informed. We do a lot of reading. And we knew exactly who Carol Quigley was. Carol Quigley, Professor Carol Quigley, wrote the book about the conspiracy. He wrote a, I wrote a, a thousand page history entitled Tragedy and Hope, some copies of which are in the back. And in that he explained how this group of very wealthy, powerful men had decided to create this world system. And he said he agrees with them. He thinks it's a wonderful thing they're doing that they want world peace. He said the only, the only thing he disagreed was the fact that they wanted to remain secret. He said they've, they've been very influential and they ought to come out and say who they are because what they want is so wonderful. Unfortunately, the men he was writing about disagreed with him. And so tragedy and hope was withdrawn from the bookstores and suddenly you couldn't find the book anymore. Extremists had read the book and found out what was going on and began quoting the book, saying here, you see, there is a conspiracy. It's not a myth, it's not, it's not something made up that, that Robert Welsh made up. There does exist this conspiracy. And Carol Quigley documented it. In fact, he, he wrote another book entitled The Anglo-American Establishment, in which he went year by year, showed how this conspiracy has operated, its influence on foreign policy and, every, and, and uh, uh, culture over the years. Quigley was Bill Clinton's professor at Georgetown University. And that book had already come out, so Clinton knew what was in the book. How did I get involved in this? Well, I was a book editor at Grosset and Dunlap in New York City. And a friend of mine by the name of Watson Washburn came to my office and asked me to become a member of, of the National Advisory Council of his newly uh, formed organization called the Reading Reform Foundation. So I asked him, I said, well, what's the purpose of the Reading Reform Foundation? He said, well, it's to get phonics back in the schools. Well, I looked at him, what do you mean get phonics back in the schools? Since when was it taken out? How can you teach anyone to read without it? So he explained to me how in the early 1930s, the professors of education uh, threw out the alphabetic phonics method of teaching reading, which is the proper way to teach children to read. And they put in this new look, say, whole word or sight method that teaches children to read English as if it were Chinese, an ideographic uh, writing system. And I thought to myself, well, this is preposterous. You can't possibly learn to read English that way. Our, our system is not Chinese. Our words are not little characters. 
And, and so he uh, suggested that I read Dr. Rudolf Flesch's book, Why Johnny Can't Read, which I did. Now, that book was published in 1955, which shows you how far back the reading problem goes. 1955, Why Johnny Can't Read. And in that book, Flesch said, well, the reason why Johnny can't read is because he's not being properly taught. And he explained how when you impose an ideographic teaching system, instruction on an alphabetic writing system, you get reading disability. Well, he figured that out. Didn't take very much to figure that one out. And I be we began to ask ourselves, well, why are, the, why are the educators doing this? Don't they know that they are causing reading disabilities by imposing this ideographic technique on a teaching technique on an alphabetic system? And we wondered, <clears throat> why are they doing this? Well, of course, uh, Flesh implied that they were stupid. They didn't like that one, one bit, you know. And that's why they came down so heavily on him. In the first place, Flesh wrote this book for the general public. And these men were not stupid. They were not stupid men because they were giving out PhDs to everybody else. So they were not stupid. They knew what exa exactly they wanted. <clears throat> At that time, I assumed that maybe there was a an economic reason. Maybe there was money involved because you see it's very inexpensive to teach a child to read with alphabetic phonics. You know, the teach, you teach the child to recognize the letters of the alphabet and then you teach the letter sounds and before you know it the child can read and you can do that very simply without, without much expenditure. As a matter of fact, if you look at the little books that were used back in the 1830s and 40s to teach children to read, you know, you, slip, you can slip them in your pocket. Tiny little books, you know. <clears throat> so it's very inexpensive. But to teach a child to read English as if it were Chinese, oh, well, you need lavishly illustrated books. And you have to repeat the same words over and over and over again. Look, 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 see, see, see. Go, go, go. As a matter of fact, I think that's where the go-go girls got there from, from go, go, you know. Where else, where else would anyone think of anything as foolish as go-go girls? It would have to come from Dick and Jane, you know, see, spot, run. Yeah. But in any case, but they were very, ex and you need a whole shelf of books to teach a child to read that way because it works so slowly. They learned 48 words the first year and then another 55 words the second year and then another 85 words the third year. It's laborious, it's slow, it's tedious. And, um, and so that's the, the method that, that they were using. Well. <clears throat> and, and you know, incidentally, uh, it isn't easy keeping someone in school for 12 years and making sure that they come out functionally illiterate, you know. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with them for 12 years? Well, what you do is you pretend to teach and the kids pretend to learn. It isn't easy producing functional literacy. You need specially trained teachers, <laughs> special textbooks. Special reading programs, and we've got them all over America. One of them is called Reading Recovery. It's probably being used right here in Albany, I'm sure, or Schenectady. It's all over the place. Whole language is, is the latest version of the look-same method. And whole language is, is about as, as bad as you can possibly get. Because they, there they have a, in whole language, they also change the definition of reading. You see, in whole language, you, you assume that they want the children to learn to read. But whole language has an entirely different uh, idea of, uh, gives you an entirely uh, a different idea of what, what reading is. Let me give you an idea of what whole, how whole language views reading. You see, the only way that they can get away, that they can get away with functional illiteracy is to change the definition of reading. Oh, reading isn't what you think it is. It's something entirely different, and I will read to you one of their definitions given in a book entitled Whole Language, What's the Difference? Quote, whole language represents a major shift in thinking about the reading process. Rather than viewing reading as getting the words, whole language educators view reading as essentially a process of creating meanings. Meaning is created through a transaction with whole meaningful texts. It is a transaction, not an extraction of the meaning from the print in the sense that the reader created meanings are a fusion of what the reader brings and what the text offers. 
In a transactional model, words do not have static meanings, rather they have meaning potentials and the capacity to communicate multiple meanings. So that's their definition of reading. Hey kids, reading is anything you say it is. In other words, it's a totally subjective activity. See, when you read by phonics, it's totally objective. You want to know, what does the author say? That's the first thing you want to know. Here, they're not worried about what the author says. They say, you create the meaning. You just use the author as uh, literary putty. And you make of it whatever you want. You come up with your own interpretation. Because words have, you know, uh, meaning potentials. That sort of thing. That's how they get away with whole language. And, and you'd be surprised how many so-called sane educators subscribe to that sort of thing. It's ridiculous, but that's, that's what we're dealing with. I decided I wanted to become a, a full-time writer, and I left the publishing business. And uh, I went to a friend of mine, uh, Neil McCaffrey, who owned the Conservative Book Club, and I asked him what kind of books he was interested in. I had a few ideas which he wasn't interested in, but he said, you know, we're interested in a book on how to start your own private school. There seems to be a, a, a revival of interest in private education. Parents are becoming disillusioned with the public schools. Now, this was 1970 around then. And so I did a little research and I told him, I said, yeah, I think uh, I can do a book on the subject. So I traveled all over the country and I visited private schools of every possible kind, started by parents to find out how they did it and all of that. I visited military academies to investigate different curricula, et cetera. How do you raise money for schools and all of that. And then I decided that I wanted to get into the public schools because I wanted to find why are parents so dis you know, disillusioned with public education. What's going on? I lived in the town of Quincy, which is a suburb of, of uh, Boston. So the easiest way to get into a, into a public school is to become a substitute. The qualifications are very simple. All you have to do is be warm. <laughs> <laughs> and that qualifies you to, to teach. And so I started teaching in the high schools and junior high schools of uh, Quincy, Massachusetts, and, and no sooner was I in North Quincy High School, and I was, I was shocked. First of all, I was shocked by the way the kids were dressed. I mean, when I was going to school, we actually wore a shirt and a tie and a jacket and trousers. These kids were wearing Mickey Mouse t-shirts and torn jeans and you name it. I mean, it looked like a gypsy bazaar. And I thought, what the heck is going on here? And then the whole place seemed academically slovenly. You know, things were all over the place, books, you know. When I was going to school, if there was a, you know, just a, a piece of paper on the floor, I mean, it was unsightly. You know, those beautiful wooden floors in the old schools, if you saw a scrap of paper, you picked it up. In this school, there were whole books on the face down, lying there, nobody bothering to pick them up. And I thought, something is strange, something is wrong with American education. And then, of course, in, in the English classes where I had the kids reading aloud, I couldn't believe how they were stumbling and mumbling. They were reading like a bunch of foreigners. I mean, these kids had been born in America, were going to a public school, and they were reading as if they had just gotten off the boat. Of course, in those days, you came over on a boat. My parents came over on a boat. Today, you come over on a 747. But in any case, I, I was quite alone, so I decided, gee, I thought that Rudolf Flesch had solved the problem. You know, he, he told us why the kids weren't learning to read. How come the educators uh, didn't take his advice, didn't, uh, didn't decide to go back to intensive systematic phonics, which was the way I had been taught to read, and people of my generation, we had all been taught to read. There was no such thing as reading disability, no such thing as dyslexia when I was going to school. So uh, I decided that I would do a book on the reading problem. To After I finished the book on private schools, I would bring the, the reading problem up to date, and I wrote a book entitled The New Illiterates. And in that book, I was very concerned about finding out who in his right mind invented, thought of the idea that you could teach children to read English as if it were Chinese. It seemed like such a preposterous idea that I thought it had to be a lunatic of some kind. But lo and behold, I found out that it was not a lunatic. It was a very rational, 
wonderful man, a man by the name of Thomas H. Gallaudet, the Reverend Thomas H. Gallaudet, the teacher of the deaf and dumb in Hartford, Connecticut in the 1830s. He was a teacher of the deaf, and the way he taught the deaf to read was to use a whole word method because they could not hear sounds. So he would juxtapose a word next to a picture, and the deaf were able to gain a, a, a bit of, of reading skill in that manner. So he thought, well, gee, maybe this method could be adapted for use by normal children. And it would save them all the difficulty of having to learn all the letters and the letter sounds. All they have to do is look at the word and they'd know it. Uh, you just tell them what the word is and they'd learn it. And then after a while, you teach them the, the letter sounds. But you can delay that. And so he brought out a little prima called the Mother's Prima. And it was published in 1837, and it was adopted by the Boston Primary Schools. And it was used in the Boston Primary Schools until 1844, when the, uh, when the schoolmasters threw up their hands in disgust and said, this method of teaching reading is creating a bunch of illiterates. We've got to get rid of it. And they wrote a stinging critique of this new look-say method. And they explain exactly why you can't impose an ideographic teaching technique on an alphabetic system. They explained it beautifully. As a matter of fact, when, I, when the book was published, I included that critique in the book itself, verbatim, because I wanted the reader to know how far back this problem went and how it had been solved back in the 1840s. Now, it's interesting, at that time also, the public school movement was was coming was coming about, and one of the one of the most important uh, one of the most important aspects of public education was to have government teachers colleges. The government was now going to get in, in, involved in teaching uh, teachers. This had pre previously been the domain of private academies. Private academies taught teachers how to teach, but now the government was going to do it thanks to Horace Mann. And uh, what do you think the first things they began teaching teachers how to teach? The look-say method, the whole word method of teaching reading, and also phrenology. Phrenology is the, uh, you know, was the earliest form of educational psychology, you know, bumps on the head. In other words, all of your, your personality traits, uh, each one is in a special part of the brain. So if there's a murderous part of your brain, there's a benevolent part of your brain, and the reason why a murderer becomes a murderer is because that lobe is a little bigger than the benevolent lobe. So they said, well, if you want to correct that, what you have to do is give a, a lot of intensive training on the benevolent lobe in order to reduce the influence of the murderous lobe. This was considered science by the educators in the 1840s, which gives you an idea of the minute the government gets involved in education, what happens? It goes off its, you know, its rocker, so to speak. Also, what I did in that, writing that book is I did a line-by-line -line study of the Dick and Jane reading program, and I came to the conclusion that anyone taught to read exclusively by that method would exhibit the symptoms of dyslexia. So again, I thought to myself, Something's wrong here. Here's a method of teaching that produces this thing called dyslexia. It's being used throughout the schools in the United States. And uh, why? I mean, is this, uh, don't they know what they're doing? And of course, eventually I found out that they knew exactly what they were doing. The American people have been sold a bill of goods. They've been told that the reason why kids become dyslexic is because there's something wrong with the kids. There's nothing wrong with the way they're teaching reading, you see. It's all the kids' fault. There's something wrong with the children. After I finished that book, I, I, when I wrote The New Illiterates, I decided, well, I'd better write a book that tells parents how to teach their children reading, writing, and arithmetic in the traditional manner, because I felt it's one thing to criticize what's going on in the schools. It's one thing to tell parents how awful the public schools are and that they are doing things that are harming the kids. Well, you've got to provide parents with the means of redress. And so I wrote a book entitled uh, How to Tutor, which covers the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Reading by intensive systematic phonics, writing, cursive writing, 
You see, I was taught cursive in the first grade. And you tell parents today you ought to teach your child cursive. To, don't teach them to print. Teach cursive. They look at you. What do you mean teach cursive first? Has that ever been done before? And I say, yes, it was done when I was going to school. I mean, we were taught penmanship. We were taught cursive. And the reason why they taught cursive first was because once you developed good penmanship, you could learn to print very nicely later on. But you see, the opposite happens if you teach print first. If you teach a child to print first, they'll spend the first two years printing, and then you'll say, okay, now we're going to cursive. Well, what happens? Most kids will say, hey, I've developed this print style. Forget about going to cursive. I'm not going to slow down and start learning each letter as if I'm in the first grade. So I'm going to print for the rest of my life. Then you have others who develop a kind of hybrid, you know, part print, part cursive. You all know about that form of writing. <laughs> and then there are those kids who develop a good cursive, regardless of what the school does. Why? Because they've been secretly practicing it against the teacher's wishes and against even their parents' wishes, you know, because they've always wanted to write like a grown-up. They've wanted to write cursive, and so they've done it from the very beginning, but they've hidden it. And in the third grade, they can come out, you see. <laughs> you see. They come out of the closet, as the homosexuals would say. Cursive is very important. And then I decided to include a, a, a section on arithmetic, because, you know, we had the new math, and now we have the new, new math. And they're told that kids no longer have to memorize the arithmetic facts. So all they have to do now is have a little calculator, you know. They don't know when they've made a mistake on the calculator. How do they know if it isn't up here, you see? And so I developed this, this arithmetic program. And incidentally, the word arithmetic isn't used anymore, as you know. Everything is called math. Why do they do that? Because they want to... They want to deny the children knowledge of what arithmetic is. You see, and I, and I ask every audience this same question. I, I ask them, well, how many of you uh, use algebra frequently? You got a few hands. How many of you use trigonometry re, uh, frequently? A few hands. How many of you use calculus frequently? A few hands. Usually engineers, you know. Then I ask everybody, how many of you use arithmetic frequently? And everybody's hand goes up. You know, these are at home school conferences. And I say, well, if everybody must use arithmetic in order to survive, why don't they teach it well? You see, arithmetic is a counting system. It's all it is. It's a counting system that uses 10 symbols to do everything. And the only way you can use it proficiently is to memorize the arithmetic facts. It's as simple as that. Because it is an abstract system using 10 symbols that permits you to do it all up here. The calculator becomes up there. And I wrote this other book, Alpha Phonics, because I wanted, I, I began doing some tutoring myself, and I needed a large size book that I could use directly with youngsters. Now, if you notice, no pictures. No singing, no dancing, no games, no jumping, just simple, Tell, teach the kids the alphabetic system and they'll learn it and they're, and they're happy about it. So that's what I did and, and it's being used by thousands and thousands of homeschoolers all over America very successfully and I'm very happy that I was able to do that. Then I also wanted to find out why did the American people give up uh, their control of education to the government so early in their history? I mean, it just didn't make sense. Here was this America started by uh, people who believed in freedom, and, and education was in, in the hands of basically in the private sector. You did have common schools in New England and in New York State, created by New Englanders who had migrated uh, westward. But even those little common schools were run by the local uh, towns, local communities, and they were supported by local uh, provision. But why did, the, why did the American people decide that they needed centralized, bureaucratized education controlled by an elite uh, that would decide what books to read, what courses to give? Where did that come from? Well, I, I spent four years investigating that whole business, and I found out that the originators the originators of the 
of the government school system basically came out of Harvard University. They were the Harvard Unitarians. You see now, what, what was the interesting, the, the interesting thing about the Unitarians is that they were the sons and daughters of Calvinists and they were rebelling against Calvinism. Now, why were they rebelling against Calvinism? Well, first of all, they didn't like the idea of Calvin's view of human nature, is that man is innately depraved. Innate depravity is one of the Calvinist uh, precepts. They didn't like that. Uh, they said, man is not innately depraved. Why, he's morally perfectible. He's a wonderful, wonderful uh, creature. All he needs is a good education. See, because uh, they had to deal with the problem of evil. Uh, how do you deal with evil? The Calvinists said, well, how do you get rid of evil? You live according to biblical law. You, lead according, you, you live your life according to how God says you ought to lead it. And if you do that, you can lead a happy, long, productive life. And if you uh, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, your sins will be forgiven and God help us, we all need forgiveness. So there you had salvation, and you had an explanation for human behavior, which has stood the test of time. Well, the, Calvin, uh, the Unitarian said, well, first of all, Christ is not divine. He's no more divine than any of us. We're all divine, they said. Uh, Christ is, um, is, is not uh, God on earth. He's a, he was a great teacher. And... Uh, We've got, to get, we've got to get Calvinism out of the schools because Calvinism is telling people that they are innately sinful, innately depraved. And if you keep telling people that, well, the power of suggestion, they're going to act that way. And so they said, we've got to have government schools that will remove religion from the uh, curriculum. In other words, yeah, you can have a watered-down Christianity, you can have a non-sectarian, watered-down Christianity, but you cannot have Calvinism in the schools. And the only way that we can assure that children are not, uh, are not um, subjected to, exposed to Calvinism, is to create government schools. You know, it's very interesting, when the Calvinists were teaching the children to read, back in the New England Prima, when they were teaching the letter A, it said, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. Now, that's pretty heavy stuff for a six-year-old, isn't it? In Adam's fall, we sinned all. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little different from see Jane jump or, or, see, or see spot, you know, jump. A little more meat to it, wouldn't you say? And uh, that was the Calvinist view. You'd better tell kids very early in life that they are sinners so that they will... Uh, grow up to be decent human beings, recognizing that they have to control themselves. You see, that's the key to a free society, is control of one's potential evil. That's the key. To, and it was de Tocqueville who recognized that. He said, the reason why Americans are so free is because they are so self-controlled. They are self-controlled by their religion. Well, the... the uh, Unitarians decided that that was a lot of rot. They said man is, is perfectible, morally perfectible, and we will create the education system for them. They said, what is the cause of evil? Ignorance, poverty, and social injustice. So if we get rid of ignorance through a good education, we'll then get rid of poverty, and once you get rid of poverty, you'll get rid of social injustice, and we will have a perfect society. Now, they really believed in that. And the reason why they put so much effort so much of their messianic effort into creating the public school system was because they wanted to prove that they were right and that the Calvinists were wrong. Well, after 150 years, it turns out that the Calvinists were right and that the Unitarians were wrong. Now, I could prove that very simply. If you believe that evil is caused by ignorance, poverty, and social injustice, let's put it to the test. One of the most evil men in the 20th century was Dr. Mengele the doctor at Auschwitz concentration camp who did hideous experiments on human beings. Very evil man. I mean, you know, in a depravity you couldn't imagine. Now, was he ignorant? No, he was given the best education that Germany could provide. He went to the best universities, became a medical doctor. Was he a, was he a, a victim of poverty? 
No, his parents said uh, he came from a, a wealthy industrial family. Well, was he uh, subjected to social injustice? Of course not. He was a member of the elite. He was persecuting others. So how come he turned out the way he did? Because of his innate depravity, which he was able to give full force because he no longer believed in God. He rejected the God of the Bible and decided to live and to do the things that he wanted to do according to his desires. And of course, he had a Nazi government to help him. You see, without a Nazi government, he would have simply been another doctor who might have done some crazy things and, and committed criminal acts. But um, once he was no longer had the protection of the Nazi government, he was pretty much of a normal so-called normal human being. In other words, the potential is there. In any case, that's how the public school system got, that's why the government got involved. It was not something that the American people were clamoring for, had nothing to do with literacy, nothing to do with economics. It was philosophical and it was religious. And incidentally, the Unitarians became the secular humanists of today. I mean, that's, that's the source of humanism. And in fact, that's the source of American liberalism. Because the Unitarians said, the only way that you can solve the problems of man is through social action. And that's why they got involved in politics. And that's why to this very day, they rely on the government to solve all problems. Secular humanists uh, today that's what they advocate. But even some of them are having second thoughts. I understand now that some humanists are actually becoming homeschoolers. They're actually deserting the public schools. There was another group that also came on the scene at that time. And that was the Owenite Socialists. Now, who were the Owenite Socialists? Well, it's very interesting. People seem to think that communism and, Marx, and socialism started with Karl Marx. It didn't. It started with Robert Owen in England. He came and he believed that religion was the cause of all of our problems. And so he came to this country to set up a communist colony, a communist experiment, a secular communist experiment in the United States. He set that up in New Harmony, Indiana. So they had this communist colony in New Harmony, Indiana. It lasted for two years and it was a total failure. Well, he analyzed why it failed, and he said, well, the reason why it's failed is because if you, are edu if you were educated under the old system, you couldn't possibly adapt yourself to the communist way of life. And so he said, what we need is a government system of education that will educate the children in such a manner that they will become little communists. And he even, uh, he even, uh, suggested that the children be taken away from the parents and put into sort of boarding schools so that they would have as little influence from their parents as possible. So the, the Owenites then joined the Unitarians in this movement for public education. But the Owenites could not do it openly because the American people knew that they were atheists and just the term atheism was so, was so bad in those days that they decided that they would have to go underground and create cells, secret communist cells in the United States in the 1830s to promote the idea of public education. Now, one of the men who was one of the secret agents was a man by the name of Orestes Brownson, who later became a Catholic and wrote about all of this. And he, and he, he wrote, he said, uh, uh, writing about this movement, he said, the great object was to get rid of Christianity and to convert our churches into halls of science. That's what the Russians did, didn't they, when they took over the churches and they turned them into halls of science or stables. The plan was not to make open attacks on religion, although we might belabor the clergy and bring them into contempt where we could, but to establish a system of state, we said national schools from which all religion was to be excluded, in which nothing was to be taught but such knowledge as is verifiable by the census and to which all parents were to be compelled by law to send their children. 
The first thing to be done was to get this system of schools established. For this purpose, a secret society was formed, and the whole country was to be organized somewhat on the plan of the Carbonari of Italy, or as were the revolutionists throughout Europe by Bazard preparatory to the revolutions of 1820 and 1830. This organization was commenced in 1829 in the city of New York, and to my own knowledge, was affected throughout a considerable part of New York State. So there you have it in the words of a man who was a participant, that all of this was being done despite what the American people wanted. So there you had the Unitarians, you had the Owenites, then you had the Hegelians, the Harvard Hegelians who believed in the dialectic, in thesis and, 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 and antithesis, they were statists who believed that God, the state was God walking on earth. And then lastly, you had the Protestants. Now, why did the Protestants join this terrible movement? Well, in the 1840s, there was such alarm over large-scale Catholic immigration to the United States that the Protestants decided they'd better go along with this government education system because that, through a government education system, they could proselytize the Catholics, turn them into Protestants, and maintain the Protestant social culture of the United States. What do you think the Catholics did? The Catholics said, uh, well, we want, uh, if you want public schools, we'd like to have public schools of our own too. And the powers that be said, uh, oh no, Catholics can't have public schools of their own because if the Catholics can have them, then the Methodists will want them. And the Episcopalians will want them, and the Presbyterians will want them. We can't have that. We can only have a non-sectarian public education system. And so what did the Catholics do? They bolted the public school system and set up their own parochial school system. Paid by themselves, run by themselves, and they maintained basically a conservative uh, counterbalance to the liberalism that the, that the Unitarians were... Uh, pushing in the United States. So in a sense, the Catholics uh, did a great service to America by maintaining a certain conservatism and belief in God and Jesus Christ, while Protestants were wandering off into this Unitarianism and all kinds of other isms. And so in a sense, we have to thank them. They created their own school system, and of course, they, they educated their, their kids very well. The academics was great, and everyone admired what they were teaching, and of course, they maintain their, their uh, religion. That's how we got public education. We've had it now for over 150 years. It is now in such a horrible state that everybody is clamoring for reform. And of course, what kind of reform are we getting? We're getting socialism imposed on the United States. We're getting, the system has been taken over by the socialists at the turn of the century, John Dewey and his and his colleagues, all socialists, decided to change America from a capitalist, individualistic, believing nation into a socialist, collectivist, atheist nation. And how are they going to do that? They said, well, we've got to change the curriculum in the public schools because American adults are not about to give up their, their private property or their religion, so we're going to have to do it uh, in education. We're going to have to change the curriculum so that the children will be brought up as little socialists and little communists. And that's what we're doing today with group learning. All of that activity is now going in the school is to destroy individualism. Another important thing that Dewey did, he analyzed the capitalist religious system and the education that was bolstering it, that, was, that, that maintained it, that sustained it. And he said the one culprit that sustains that system is high literacy, this tremendous emphasis put on language learning. Why? Because if you teach a child to read well phonetically, they think logically, they can stand on their own two feet and think for themselves, they can read books, they can find out what's going on, they don't need the collective, they don't need the group. What's more, he said that people who can read well will curl up on a couch with a book and, would, and don't care about their you know, brethren. He wrote that essay in 1898, and the educators started working on that, and by 1930, of course, the Dick and Jane books were written. Well, the early part of history is in this book, the Is Public Education Necessary?, which, you, which I think you will enjoy because it, it gives you that whole background why the basic premises of public education was rotten to begin with. 
It's based on false ideas. And in my later book, NEA Trojan Horse in American Education, I come up to the present uh, and show the development of the progressive movement. Now, the NEA is an instrument of the progressive movement. It's an instrument of the one world philosophy. It's an instrument of UNESCO, the United... As a matter of fact, it was the NEA that started UNESCO, that created UNESCO, because they were looking forward to a world board of education. And all of the plans being made by our educators today, school to work, are coordinated which, with what is being done all over the globe. That's why they keep talking about world-class standards. They don't tell you what those standards are. What they mean is our standards have to be lowered to world class. Because we had the best education system in the world. Certainly when I was going to school, it was pretty good. Do you remember those days? And now everything has to be lowered. Everyone has to be dumbed down to fit into this school to work uh, scheme that they've got. All done by... The key individuals involved in this thing, Mark Tucker. I don't know how many, how many of you have heard of Mark Tucker? Who is Mark Tucker? Well, he's the head of a, of a think tank called the National Center for Education and the Economy. Mark Tucker uh, came up through the ranks of the nonprofit organizations. He was born in Massachusetts, graduated from Brown University. His first job was with public radio. His second job was with a, a, an education lab supported by the federal government. His third job was with the U.S. Department of Education. His fourth job was with the Carnegie Corporation Foundation. And in that period, he wrote all of these, you know, Goals 2000 type of, of, of uh, reports that have had a, a tremendous influence on education reform in the United States. As a matter of fact, he and his group working with Hillary and, and Bill Clinton, produced the system that we have today. As a matter of fact, his uh, National Center for Education and the Economy was first financed by Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo gave them a couple of million dollars and they set up headquarters in Rochester, New York, because they felt that, oh, Mark Tucker, he's, he's the new messiah. He's going to give us the kind of education system that we need for the new world order, you see. Now, on his board of trustees, first he had Mario Cuomo at the top. Here's a, here's a copy of his letterhead. He wrote a letter to Hillary Clinton, November 11th, 1992, right after Bill had been elected uh, president. You see, he had gotten to know the Clintons during the years when the governor's conferences were creating Goals 2000 and the formulating the plan. And he says, Dear Hillary, I still cannot believe you won, but utter delight that you did pervades all the circles in which I move. I met last Wednesday in David Rockefeller's office with him, John Scully, Dave Barham, and David Hazelcorn. It was a great celebration. Both John and David R. were more expansive than I have ever seen them, literally radiating happiness. John D. Rockefeller Jr. is the son of, uh, uh, I mean, David Rockefeller Jr. is the son of David Rockefeller. So he reflects his father's views. The subject we were discussing was what you and Bill should do now about education, training, and labor market policy. And what follows are 18 pages, an 18-page letter in which he describes the entire plan for Hillary so that she'd know exactly what Bill had to do. And lo and behold, four years later, it is done through your Congress. They got it through. Of course, they started quite early. They started first with George Bush. You remember his famous State of the Union message and when he talked about America 2000. Where did he get those ideas from? Did he pull them out of the ozone? Where do, where do such ideas come from? They come from people like Mark Tucker, you see. So he was George Bush, a Republican president, promoting the ideas of a left-wing socialist think tank. How come George Bush didn't go to a group of conservatives and say, come up with an education reform plan? 
Oh, no, this is a given. You see, this is part of that whole world, new world system. And so uh, Bush promoted it. And of course, Clinton is promoting it. The interesting thing about this letterhead is who is on it? You've got James B. Hunt, vice chairman. He's a governor of North Carolina. You've got Hillary Clinton, who at that time was with the Rose Law Firm. Ira Magaziner, her, you know, her buddy in this uh, conspiracy. David Rockefeller, Jr. And then you've got Richard P. Mills. You know who Richard P. Mills is? He's your commissioner of education. And he comes out of this. So he agrees with this communist plan to socialize American education, to create school to work. You see, they have the power now. And I'll, I'll tell you how far it's gotten. They passed, the, uh, the uh, Democratic Congress passed what Bill wanted. Goals 2000, careers, all of that. So they've had the initial money. They've had the initial financing to get this thing started. Now what they needed was additional financing to consolidate everything. And that was, there were two bills which were being pushed through Congress, through the Republican Congress. H.R. 1617 and S-143, the two bills that would uh, fund, fully fund this socialist plan, school to work plan. It, it breezed through Congress, breezed through the Republican Congress. Most Republicans voted for it as if they'd been asleep. And then it was in committee to be reconciled. And those of us who have been following all of this realize this has got to be stopped. We've got to do something about this. And we had a meeting last February in St. Louis where a group of us decided we've got, to, we've got to let the congressmen know what they're doing. We've got to let the American people know what's happening. And so we began agitating. And our people began getting to Congress. And at least one congressman decided to go along with us. And that was Henry Hyde of Illinois. In fact, he distributed copies of this letter to all of his colleagues. This famous letter from Mark Tucker to Hillary Clinton. This is the greatest bonanza that is, we've had ever since when it fell into our hands. Nobody knows how we got it. People call me and they say, can you send me a crisp copy of this letter? You know, a mint copy of the letter? Because this has been, you know, Xeroxed and Xeroxed and faxed and Xeroxed, and so it's, it's a little difficult to read, but it's still quite readable. And I tell him, well, why don't you call Mark Tucker's office? Maybe he'll send you a copy of his, of his letter. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you let him know your interest in his wonderful program. So it was in committee. Uh, Henry Hyde started telling his, his, his colleagues what this was all about, and finally, during this last, the last couple of weeks when they were trying to tie up all the loose ends, you know, and the Republicans were, were capitulating all over the place, giving Clinton just about everything he wanted. And I heard they were giving him all this money on education. And I thought, oh, my God, I hope that, he, that they didn't cave in on 1617 and S-143. Well, I got a call from somebody in Michigan who told me, no, it didn't pass. Trent Lott tabled the two bills. They'll have to be taken up at the next Congress. So we were saved by the bell. And I asked him, well, how was it done? He said, well, there's this lady in California who went to Congress, who went to Washington, flew all, she created an organization called Parents Involved in Education. And she went to Washington and started talking to the congressman and that's what did it. The point I'm trying to make is it only takes a handful of people of concerned people to stop this. We don't need an army. We don't need the, 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 you know, the, the American people who are half asleep to get up in arms and march on Washington. No, all we need is a, a, a small but vociferous, well-informed group to ride herd on the Congress of the United States. That's what we need, you see. And that's what we have now. We have this network that we've created over the years through studying this and having a, 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 uh, an intimate knowledge of this. And of course, Mark Tucker's letter helped us a great deal.
And the reason why we know that this is a totalitarian system is because of the data collection system that has been, uh, that has been created. Do you know that in Washington, D.C. is this fantastic computer, this humongous computer that's waiting to be put online? All they were waiting for was the money from these two bills. These two bills would have funded putting this gigantic computer online. What, what was going to be in that computer? Personal, intimate information about every single individual. As a matter of fact, Mark Tucker describes exactly what, what this program is. He says, what is essential is that we create a seamless web of opportunities to develop one's skills that literally extends from cradle to grave and is the same system for everyone, young and old, poor and rich, worker and full-time student. Egalitarianism. Everybody's going to get the same education. Young and old, rich and poor, cradle to grave. And so they need a computer system that's going to organize all of that. And it is in Washington. And I got the two handbooks that have been completed by these bureaucrats, these bureau rats, who infest the bowels of the bureaucracy in Washington and have been working at this all of these years. You know that this has been in the works since the 1970s? These are not things that just came up all of a sudden. As I explained earlier, Benjamin Bloom was working in the 50s on this. But now it's all coming to the surface. And this computer is sitting there and waiting to be put online. And we've, we've stopped it so far. But what kind of information do they want? Well, I got the two handbooks. The student data handbook and the staff data handbook. If any of you want to get these handbooks, let me give you the code numbers. The student data handbook is NCES, that's National Center for Education Statistics, 94-303. The staff data handbook is NCES 95-327. All I did was phone the Department of Education. Somebody gave me the phone number, and I asked for the two handbooks, and they were sent to me. And so I read them over, and I, was, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I'll give you the idea of the kind of information. First of all, they not only, you know, when I was going to school, all they wanted to know was my name and address, and the names of my parents, and the date of birth. That was it. That's all they wanted to know. Here they want to know not only, you know, your name and address. Uh, they want to, for example, just in identification, uh, they, want, they, have, uh, they want to know your driver's license, your health record number, your Medicaid number, your migrant student number, your uh, professional certificate or license number, school assigned number, selective service number, social security administration number, college board, ACT code set of PK grade 12 institutions, local education agency, state education agency, uh, just about everything they can to I just identify you. Religion. They didn't want to know my religion when I was going to school. And, in those, and when I joined the army, all they want to know was whether I was Protestant, Catholic, or Jew. That was it. This is what they're going to have, and this is what they want to know. And, and all of these have code numbers. They want to know if you're Amish, Assembly of God, Baptist, Buddhist, Calvinist, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Episcopal, Friends, Greek Orthodox, Hindu, Islamic, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jewish, Latter-day Saints, Lutheran, Mennonite, Methodist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, other Christian denomination, Seventh-day Adventist, Tao, none other. They didn't list Unitarian, Universalist Unitarians for some strange reason. I guess they're known as other. Why do they want to know all this about your religion? I'll tell you why, because if you're a Calvinist, you're conservative. If you're Presbyterian, you're liable to be conservative, you see. Uh, so they want to know exactly what you are. Then they have, um, they're very much interested in, uh, in your assessments. They have a, they have a very large uh, section on assessments. For example, there are the different types of assessments. Achievement test, advanced placement test, aptitude test, attitudinal test. And here's how they describe an attitudinal test an assessment to measure the mental and emotional set or patterns of likes and dislikes or opinions 
held by a student or a group of students. This is often used in relation to considerations such as controversial issues or personal adjustments, unquote. Cognitive and perceptual skills tests, uh, developmental observation, interest inventory, language proficiency tests, manual dexterity tests, mental ability, performance uh, assessment, etc., etc., personality test, portfolio assessment. Somebody asked me over the phone, uh, no, it was the talk show host, he asked me about portfolios, will they be included? And I said, yeah, they'll have an assessment, portfolio assessment is involved. Psychological test, psychomotor test, reading readiness test, etc. Can you imagine all this information in a computer in Washington? That's not all. They want everything about your health. Very concerned about every possible thing that can, can be wrong with you. Very much concerned about your teeth. Here's the kind of information they want to know about your teeth. Number of teeth. Number of... <laughs> of course, that varies from time to time. So they have to keep it up date, you know. So-and-so lost a tooth on such and such a day, you know. Number of permanent teeth lost. Number of teeth decayed. Number of teeth restored. Occlusion condition. Now, I think occlusion has to do with the bite. Is that it? Is there a dentist around here? Okay. Occlusion condition with subcategories normal occlusion, mild malocclusion, moderate malocclusion, severe malocclusion. Gingival condition. That's the gums, with subcategories, normal, mild deviation, moderate deviation, severe deviation, oral soft tissue condition, with subcategories, normal, mild deviation, moderate deviation, severe deviation, dental prosthetics. I don't know if that's braces, prosthetics. Is that braces or false teeth? And orthodontic appliances. Oh, well, those are the, that's, those are the braces. Now, I asked you, why does the government want to get into your mouth? What business is it of the government what your bite is? Why is the government concerned about your bite? Maybe they think that extremists have real bites, you know. Well, you know, I ask myself, why do they want to know all of this? Why is all of this information going to be in the computer? I think I know. Do you remember when David Koresh was burnt to a crisp? How did they identify him? Dental record. You see, these people have plans for us, and they want to be able to make sure that we're out of the way. You know, they may, God knows what methods they may use to dispose of people like me and some of you. Because if you understand what's behind that whole conspiracy, this pagan, pagans believe in human sacrifice, you know, this pagan socialist communist conspiracy. Look at how many bodies uh, the communists, how many corpses the communists are responsible for in Russia. Look at how many corpses they've managed to uh, pile up in China. Look at what they did to Cambodia. Do you think those people have any mercy? Do you think they're going to have mercy on you should they have you in their control? You know, the latest outrage that took place in a public school was in Pennsylvania recently in East Stroudsburg where these young girls were forced to strip nude and undergo a gynecological probing in the school without their parents' knowledge and without their consent. And you believe it? This happened in America? And these girls were screaming. They wanted to get out of the place. One girl wanted to jump out of the window. These were, I think, 13-year-old girls. Forcing them to strip and to undergo an examination of their most private parts. Is this America? And the parents were not informed? And the kids didn't want it? Do you know what a kind of a traumatic instance that is? Can any of you put yourself in the position of being forced to strip and undergo a probing of your private parts by a stranger? What kind of power would a person like that have to have over you before you would even submit to such an examination. You know what the Germans did when they used to round up people into the concentration camps? The first thing they did was have everybody stripped naked. Why? Because when you're naked, you're vulnerable. 
and if somebody is standing in front of you and forces you to become naked, they're saying, we own you. You are our slaves. We can do with you whatever we want. You are no longer human beings. You are our slaves. And then they give you a uniform to put on that designates that you are a slave. And this, is, and this happened in an American school, and the state of Pennsylvania tried to justify it. And the educators try to justify it. There is no justification for that. So when parents ask me, oh, well, can the public schools be reformed? I say, the only way to reform them is to get rid of them. Yes, I've long come to the view that the only solution to this education problem in America is to get the government out of the education business. In fact, there is now a movement afoot for the separation of school and state. It's called the Separation of School and State Alliance, and they are having their second conference this, uh, f uh, in, in November in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm going to take part in it. A lot of highly intelligent people are going to be there discussing this whole issue. We have finally reached the point where we know what's going to solve this problem. But now what are we dealing with? You're dealing with this education establishment that has a cash flow of billions of dollars that you are forced to support. Why? Because your legislators, your legislators keep voting them more and more money. They are organized into the National Education Association, American Federation of Teachers. They've got us uh, by the neck. And so the only, the only thing that I, I tell parents to do these days is get your kids out. Get them out as quickly as you can. Homeschool them if you can. In fact, the homeschooling movement, which now probably comprises of about a million American families, is the best thing on the horizon. Because here are American parents who are not only taking back their right to educate their children as they see fit, but are also making a clean break with this humanist status system. They are reasserting their independence as families, and they're creating an, a whole new family uh, lifestyle based on education in the family. And I've seen the homeschool movement grow because uh, I spoke oh, about 10 years ago at the first homeschool convention that they had in, uh, in Ohio was held in a church, a couple of hundred people. And this last summer, I spoke to the same organization that had to rent the Columbus Convention Center with thousands of people there. And half the people there were newcomers, young parents who have decided that their children would never see the inside of a public school. So they are waking up. There is this awakening. It's interesting. I asked uh, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the fellows who runs the Florida Homeschool Association when I was speaking, speaking at their convention. I asked him, well, how do you see the homeschool movement developing? And he said, well, in the early days, you had the pioneers, you know, 10 years ago or so. He said, after them came the settlers. They moved in. He said, now you're getting the refugees. <laughs> These are people who are streaming out of the public schools, and they're saying, we want to homeschool, but how do you do it? Tell us, teach us, you see. They're in a state of panic, because they know how bad the public schools have become, and they want to homeschool, and they need all the help they can get. So it's just a wonderful, wonderful movement in this country. It's the first true assertion of freedom on the part of the American people. The interesting thing about it is that many birchers were homeschooling before anyone else was because they understood what was going on earlier than most people. And so they were in a position to uh, understand that it, it was futile trying to uh, reform the public schools. They're not going to get back to basics. They're headlong. They're, they're going headlong toward the socialist system, the Soviet-style system. They cannot... Uh, yeah, they can be delayed. They're not going to stop. They're not going to give up. People like uh, Mark Tucker is not giving up. 
He just has another conference. The educators are not giving up. Oh, yes, they're working out their standards and their assessments, and the computer is waiting to be put online. And all of those people in the, in the as I said, the bowels of the, uh, of the bureaucracy are at work, being well paid. It's surprising how many totalitarians there are in America. See, that's, the, that's really the puzzling surprise. You would think that Americans brought up in this country to, you know, to love freedom should be so susceptible to obvious totalitarian plans. What is it in human nature that makes people turn against the good and embrace evil? Well, I think it's in the Bible. It's man's innate depravity. You can't trust man. That's why the founders of this, of this country created the kind of constitution that we had. They said, you've got to divide power up as much as possible. You've got to have separation of power so that you can't have one, one big Hitler in America. You can't have one big dictator. But what do we have? We have a lot of little Hitlers. That's what we have. A lot of little Hitlers throughout the, the bureaucracy who love nothing more than to write new regulations. You know, they're always writing new laws where, and new regulations to curtail your freedom. And it's always, a, it's always you know, a piecemeal job. They can't do it all at once, so they've been accumulating all this money. Our friend created this uh, conspiracy, Cecil Rhodes. He wrote about it quite openly. As a matter of fact, it was, his entire plan was published in the New York Times after he died when his will was read. And I read that article in the New York I said, my God, here's the whole plan. This was in, I think, believe, 1902 when Rhodes died. And in, it, in that very thing, he says, the only way that this plan can succeed is if we create a secret society that gains control of the wealth of the world. Those were his words. A secret society that can gain control of the wealth of the world. And he went to the rich. He went to Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, who had been born in Scotland and wanted very much to see a reunion between Britain and the United States. He wanted the Anglo-Saxons to get together because he said, yes, we can rule the world, you see. The Anglo-Saxons can. We're superior. And Carnegie then created his foundations with which to do that. And the interesting thing is that Rhodes told the rich, he said, why do you want to leave your money to your profligate heirs? What are they going to do with your money? They're just going to buy more yachts and build bigger houses. They're not going to do anything good for mankind. You can do, you can create world peace. You can create a system that will get rid of war forever through this world government scheme. And they bought it. They bought it. And they created the Royal Institute for International Affairs in London and the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States. That's how that organization came about. They don't see any reason to stop because so far they've been eminently successful. They control the big newspapers, they control the media, they control the schools, the education system. Why do you think all that money from the foundations have gone into these different programs? Where do you think all of these programs were first hatched? in the foundations, in the Carnegie Corporation. That's where the, these ideas are talked about and written about and then brought to Congress and enacted into law. So they have a plan. They've been working on it for years and the only way we can stop it is for the American people to be told what is happening, to wake up and to do something about it, to stop it and to re reassert their love of freedom and the desire to create an America that we have long lost. You know, I'm often, uh, uh, I did a piece on, on attention deficit disorder recently because, you know, that's two million American children are being drugged every day as they go to school with Ritalin. Why? Because supposedly they have this attention deficit. And I try to explain to people why, this, why they're doing this to the kids. First of all, when you give kids Ritalin, 
you're saying yes to drugs. And then they wonder why uh, the drug, uh, drug use in the schools has now doubled since a couple of years ago. Well, you're telling the kids that Ritalin is okay, it's a mind-altering drug, and they're taking it. But you ask yourself, why are the kids put on Ritalin? Why do we have this problem? Well, when I was going to school, back in the 1930s, we sat in rows in desks that were bolted to the floor. Do you remember that? <laughs> and we didn't have the kind of desk that you slammed the top down. You slipped your books into the desk, you know. You didn't hear that bang, you know. That, no such thing. Our attention was focused on the teacher at the front of the room. She taught us everything we had to know, and she taught everybody the same thing. So there was our focus of attention. The walls, what did you have on the walls? Maybe a picture of George Washington hanging there, an American flag. You had the, the, the blackboard with, you know, the cursive letters at the top. That was it. The place was immaculate. You didn't talk to your neighbors. You remember, if you spoke to your neighbors, you could be sent down to the principal's office. You know, that was a no-no. So you had discipline, you had quiet, and your attention was focused. Nobody had attention deficit disorder. <laughs> you couldn't possibly have an attention deficit under such conditions. Well, now you go into today's first grade classroom, what do you see? You see children seated around little, de uh, little tables. They're pestering one another, they're talking to one another, they're making life miserable for one another. Uh, the, where's the teacher? She's no longer the focus of attention. She's wandering around the room. Uh, she's now a facilitator, you see. So there's no focus of attention. Uh, everybody's got an individual education plan, so nobody is learning the same thing anymore, you know. Uh, then what do you have on the walls? Every possible space of, on the wall is covered with a cartoon, with an animal, Mickey Mouse, you name it. Then you've got tanks with gerbils, you've got fish tanks, you've got rabbits, you've, every possible distraction. You even got mobiles hanging from the ceilings. And they wonder why the kids can't pay attention. They wonder why they have an attention deficit. I mean, because the room is chaotic. It's chaos. How many kids can concentrate under chaotic conditions? Some can. They have nerves of steel. You know. Have you noticed that some kids can actually do their homework or read while listening to music? I could never do that. I could never concentrate that way. They can do it, and, and the music they're listening to is not Mozart. <laughs> and then they're using these stupid methods of teaching like whole language and, and invented spelling. <laughs> and the new, new math, and they wonder why the kids behave the way they do. As a matter of fact, all of that has been calculated. All of that has been, all of that has been tested in laboratories. You know by whom? By Pavlov, by Skinner, by other behavioral psychologists who have been studying the human mind for years and years. They know how the brain works. They're not dummies. They know that if they want to create behavioral de uh, attention deficit disorder, they know how to do it. It's no secret. As a matter of fact, uh, a book was written on the subject, and I quote it in, in, this, in, my, uh, in this book, the whole, whole language OBE fraud. It's, it's, a, it's in the chapter entitled Psychology's Best Kept Secrets. Did you know that the psychologists did experiments on how to artificially create behavioral disorder? Do you know they know how to do it? They've been working on it. As a matter of fact, Pavlov was so good at it that he said, uh, you can create, uh, this is what Pavlov wrote. And this was in the 20s. He said, the power of our knowledge over the nervous system will, of course, appear to much greater advantage if we learn not only to injure the nervous system, but also to restore it at will. It will then have been really proved that we have mastered the processes and are controlling them. Indeed, this is so. 
In many cases, we are not only causing disease, but are eliminating it with great exactitude, one might say, to order. That's Pavlov describing the results of his experiments. Now, how did he do that? How did he create behavioral disorganization? It says Pavlov, this particular book written by Alexander Luria, a top Soviet psychologist, he says, Pavlov obtained very definite affective breaks and acute disorganization of behavior each time that the conditioned reflexes collided, when the animal was unable to react to two mutually exclusive tendencies or was incapable of adequately responding to any imperative problem. So there you have it, the technique, they know how to do it. Just give the kid two conflicting orders. They go berserk. Two conflicting reflexes. You see, the whole language produces an, a holistic reflex. Kids look at words as little pictures. But in order to become a good reader, you must develop a phonetic reflex. So they know how to cause behavioral dis, uh, disorder because if you frustrate a child by preventing him from learning to read, from developing a phonetic reflex, what does frustration create? Violence. Frustration creates violence. That's where you get all this violence from. These kids in the schools now are you know, killing one another, doing all sorts of things. The point is that you can do something about it. A very small group of us have been able to at least stall this whole program. And the more we wake up the American people, the more we'll be able to turn the tide. It's not going to be easy. They've got billions of dollars. As Cecil Rhodes said, we've got, to con uh, we've got to gain control of the wealth of the world, and they have it. That's why our side never has enough money. I mean, we're, we're dealing with pennies compared to what they have. They have billions, and it's all coming out of your taxes. They have a, a direct a lien on the U.S. Treasury. But you can do something about it. I urge you not only to read my books and other books, and there's Carol Quigley's book in back there, but also to join the John Birch Society, because we need a strong John Birch Society to stand as a stalwart.